Hi everyone. Today we're going to be looking at a professionally written and published comparison contrast essay. This essay will take a little bit of explaining. Um, the good thing is that it's short. It says here that it's five pages, but actually if you go to page five, it ends right here. So it's actually four pages. But the meaning and context of this essay is not very straightforward. This essay is comparing the writing process and opening and ideas of two speeches. The second speech is Abraham Lincoln's inaugural address, the speech that Lincoln gave when he first became president. The first speech is the inaugural address of Jefferson Davis. Jefferson Davis was the first and only president of the Confederate States of America. The Confederacy was the government of the Southern States during the Civil War. So really today we're doing an American history class. Um, so we're, we're, this essay was written as part of a very fascinating and very long series by the New York Times. The American Civil War went from 1861 to 1865. That's five years. The New York Times published around one essay for every day of the Civil War. So it's th like thousands of essays. Uh, and this essay is about the moment that Davis gave his inaugural address. Um, so as I mentioned, the author will compare three things. How the address was written, uh, the ideas in the address, and how the first lines of the address of the two speeches. Um, so let's jump right in. Montgomery, Alabama, February 18, 1861. Montgomery is the capital city of Alabama state. Alabama is in the south. So you have Florida. On top of Florida, you have Georgia. To the left of Georgia, you have Alabama. And to the left of Alabama, you have Mississippi. So that's Alabama. Like a feckless college student, feckless means useless person. Like a feckless college student with a term paper deadline looming, Jefferson Davis apparently hadn't started seriously writing until the day before. That is not a good way to write a speech the day before. It's a, serious, it's a serious speech. He should have started sooner. Exhausted from a week-long railway journey. Uh, so this is in 1861. There were no airplanes. Everybody took the train. He had stayed in bed in his suite at the Exchange Hotel until after 10 a.m., then buckled down to work, which means he got down to work. So he spent a week on trains, but he didn't do any writing during that time. Now, barely 24 hours later, standing in front of the Alabama State House's portico under a wintry sky, the State House is the place of government. I think in this case, this is where Alabama's Congress meets. Alabama, go ahead, Dasha. A portico, oh, sorry, a portico is the front of a building that has a covering overhead. I guess in Chinese we might call this like Chen Uyen or something. 
and it's winter, right? It's it's February. He unfolded a thin sheaf of paper, so it's a short speech. It's a thin sheaf of paper. And began to read his inaugural address in a strong, clear baritone. A baritone is a low voice for men. And so here we have a block quotation. This is the opening of his speech. Gentlemen of the Congress of the Confederate States of America, friends and fellow citizens. Called to the difficult and responsible station of chief magistrate of the provisional government, which you have instituted. I approach the discharge of the duties assigned to me with humble distrust of my abilities but with a sustaining confidence in the wisdom of those who are to guide and aid me in the administration of public affairs and an abiding faith in the virtue and patriotism of the people. This is the first sentence. So first he says hello to everyone, and then he says that he has been called to his station or his position, his job. It is a difficult job, but and it has a lot of responsibility. Uh, this is an older use of the word responsible. Today, we would not use this word in this way, but and it means with responsibility. What job is it? Chief magistrate of the provisional government, which you have instituted. So the southern government is provisional. It was not in it was not official yet. But they first chose their president or leader or chief magistrate. A magistrate is a government leader. Uh, in Taiwan, the leader of each county is called a county magistrate, Xianzang. Which you have instituted or which you have created. So you have created this tentative government. I approach the discharge of the duties assigned to me. Discharge means perform. So the performance of the duties that you have assigned to me as president, I approach it with humble distrust of my abilities. So I may not have the abilities needed for this job. He's being a moderate. He's being modest and humble. But with a sustaining confidence. So even though I may not trust myself, I have confidence. I continue to have confidence in the wisdom of those who are to guide and aid me in the administration of public affairs. Administration just means to take care of uh, business, of public affairs. And an abiding, abiding means continuing faith in the virtue and patriotism of the people. So in plain English, what he's saying is. Hi, you have asked me to be your president for your new government, and even though I may not be able to do a good job, I trust in the people who will help me and I believe in the ordinary people's support. First sentence. Davis had indeed been called, not exactly elected, to the presidency. Just 10 days earlier, delegates, representatives, from six southern states meeting here in the Alabama capital had chosen him as the new Confederate nation's first chief executive. So the author is telling us that Davis was not elected. The six states who, which at that time made up the new government, each sent people to Alabama, and those people chose Davis. Notice that these people are not called representatives because they were not elected. They were chosen by each state's governor. And someone who represents you, who was chosen by the leader, is called a delegate. Let's 
like so many of the South's actions that winter. And then in the middle, we have three examples. The secession meetings and ratifications. Secession is the. Uh, act of. Making one part of the country leave the country. There is just something like that. If you're Chinese. Um, so the meetings about secession and ratification. Ratification means confirming in the law. So not only did the meetings agree to leave the United States, they passed a law and they asked people to vote on the law. The drafting of a constitution. A new country needs a new constitution. So like these two actions, the decision had been taken in haste. So choosing Davis as the new president, deciding to leave the country, and creating a new constitution. All three had been done very quickly. Though several other men wanted the post or the job, there had been almost no campaigning or debate. Davis's political and military experience were strong qualifications, certainly, but the most potent or powerful fact in his favor was probably that he had fewer enemies than his rivals. So they chose Davis not because he was the best leader, but because he had the fewest enemies. To me, that does not sound like a good way to choose your president. Now he was not merely the Confederacy's chief magistrate, but also its chief mouthpiece or spokesperson, Fai Yanren. Hitherto, which means up to that point, most statements on secession had come from individual states. But today it devolved upon him, it was left to him to explain to the world why the Deep South had announced its withdrawal from the Union or the rest of the country. He said, Our present political position has been achieved in a manner unprecedented in the history of nations. No country has ever done this before. And it's true, in modern political history, the southern United States, the Confederacy, was the first to try to form a new country by leaving an older country. It illustrates the American idea that governments rest on the consent of the governed. So the people have to agree with the government in order for the government to be legitimate. And that it is the right of the people to alter or abolish. Alter means change, abolish means cancel them at will whenever they become destructive of the ends for which they were established. So this sentence means that people have the right to change or cancel their government if they think that the government is not working for the people. The impartial or objective and enlightened or wise verdict, which means decision of mankind will vindicate, which means will confirm the rectitude or correctness of our conduct or action. Actually, I should translate the whole sentence. Sorry. The impartial and enlightened verdict of mankind will vindicate the rectitude of our conduct means. People who are objective and wise will confirm that we are doing the right thing. And he, you see the capital H. This means God. And God who knows the hearts of men will judge of the sincerity with which we have labored to preserve the government of our fathers in its spirit. 
so God will judge whether we are trying to do what the founding fathers of the United States were trying to do. 就是，嗯、um, ，OK， I can explain this in English. Yes. So, the South wanted to leave the country because they felt that the North was straying from the path of the original founding fathers of the nation. They felt that the North was no longer democratic, was no longer upholding the ideas of the United States. So, the South. Said that they, the South, were the true continuing of the country, and that it is the North who was now a different country. So, if we translate this paragraph into regular English, basically, it's saying we are doing something that nobody has ever done before, and by doing this, we are showing the world that. Uh, we are proving to the world the American idea that you have to agree to be governed by your government in order for that government to be a good government, and that once you don't agree with your government, you can change it or you can cancel it whenever you want. Are we doing the right thing? History and the rest of the world will judge. Are we trying to do the right thing? God will judge. I don't know about you. I think the original sounds better. Preserve the government of our fathers in its spirit. This was characteristic of the conservative tenor that pervaded Davis's address. So the author is saying that the rest of the speech is as conservative as this sentence. A、uh, tenor is like a, a an attitude or a voice in a speech. 语气语调 Pervade means that all of it is. It's it fills all of it. So the whole speech is just as conservative as this sentence. Here, the word conservative does not mean、uh, politically on the right. 保守派 Conservative means. Trying not to say a lot of new things. By his lights, in his view, the Confederacy, though its manner of birth may have been unprecedented, was hardly novel in any significant respect. Novel means new, respect means aspect. So Davis believed. That the country was born in a new way, but the country itself was not new. The ideas of the country were not new. Its constitution, he said, differs only from that of our fathers in so far as it is explanatory of their well-known intent, freed from sectional conflicts which have interfered with the pursuit of the general welfare. A、uh, sectional conflict means that different parts of the country disagree and are arguing, and he's saying that these conflicts have interfered with the pursuit of the general welfare. 共同福祉 That people have been arguing so much that the government is not doing a good job of taking care of its people. So the main difference, according to Davis. Between the Constitution of the North and the South, is that the Southern Constitution explains things more clearly, so that people have less to argue about, and so the government will not be prevented from doing its job. Okay, but then what is it trying to explain? What is this well-known intent? Members of his audience might have been forgiven for scratching their heads at this last, somewhat tortuous passage. Tortuous means not straightforward. So the author is saying, "You don't understand. The people back then did not understand either." 
but it was in fact a very delicate allusion to slavery. Delicate here means trying to be sensitive. Trying to be considerate, not offensive. Allusion means reference, pointing to. Slavery. The founding fathers well known intent in Philadelphia in 1787 had been to protect slavery. Davis hinted. Even if they had not quite made it explicit. Philadelphia in 1787 is where the Constitution was written. So Davis is suggesting that the original writers of the Constitution wanted to protect slavery, even if they didn't actually say that in the Constitution. Indeed, the American Constitution did not contain the word slave. Whereas the Confederate version defiantly repeated it 10 times. Uh, by the way, slavery is in Nuri Zidu, right? You guys know this, right? OK. Uh, mentioned it 10 times, including in this crucial or key passage. No bill of attainder, ex post facto law or law denying or impairing the right of property in Negro slaves shall be passed. So the structure of this sentence should be quite clear. You cannot pass A, B or C kind of law that would hurt the right to own black slaves. Uh, and it mentions three kinds of laws. A bill of attainder. Actually, no, let's take it in, in reverse order. A law, regular law, an ex post facto law. This is Latin and it means after. Sorry, from. After. The fact. So an ex post facto law is a law that applies to things in the past. And then the first kind of law, a bill of attainder. So usually if the government wants to punish someone, they would arrest that person and send them to court, go through a trial, and then the judge will decide whether to punish that person. A bill of attainder is a law passed by the legislature, Li Fa Rin, or Guo Hui, that directly punishes a person. No need to go through the court. Um, so. The Confederate Constitution says that no law can prevent slavery. In other words, if a country or sorry, if a state in the Confederacy wanted to. Stop or abolish slavery, they couldn't just pass a law. They had to change the Constitution. They had to get all the other states to agree to change this part of the Constitution and then pass a law. So we see how important slavery was for the Southern uh, government. But unlike Davis's farewell speech to the Senate a month earlier, Jefferson Davis was a senator, a senator in the North but he resigned a month earlier in order to become the president of the South. So unlike his earlier farewell speech, his inaugural speech included no clarion call to defend slavery and white supremacy. So when he was leaving the Senate, he defended slavery, but in this speech, the first speech as president, he did not clearly defend slavery and white supremacy. White supremacy is the idea that white people are better than everyone else and deserve more rights. Even the South's favorite euphemism, Wei Wan Si, our domestic institutions, Guo Nei Zi Du, was left unuttered. So he didn't even say this. The closest he came was in attesting that the desire to form a new nation 
was actuated or motivated solely by the desire to preserve our own rights and promote our own welfare. Rights and welfare, obviously, had very specific connotations in this context. So the author is saying only if you knew already what the southern government wanted to do, only then would you understand this phrase, our rights, our welfare. What rights? The rights to own slaves. What welfare? The welfare of slave owning people. So even though slavery was key to the South, Davis did not mention slavery in his speech. The closing lines were heavy with unintended irony, Feng Si. Davis read, It is joyous in the midst of perilous times to look around upon a people united in heart, where one purpose of high resolve animates and actuates the whole, where the sacrifices to be made are not weighed in the balance against honor and right and liberty and equality. Perilous means dangerous. So here he's talking about the civil war that will be starting soon. High resolve means high determination. Animate and actuate just means motivate. A is weighed in the balance against B means you have to choose one or the other. Here, sacrifices are not weighed against honor, right, liberty, equality. So you can have all five. To weigh something against someone else, liang xiang quan hen. Obstacles may retard, but they cannot long prevent the progress of a movement sanctified by its justice and sustained by a virtuous people. So obstacles may slow down, but they cannot long prevent the progress of a movement that has been made sacred or holy because of its justice and it is supported by a virtuous people. Reverently, let us invoke the God of our fathers to guide and protect us in our efforts to perpetuate the principles which by his blessing they were able to vindicate, establish, and transmit to their posterity. So with religious feeling, let us call upon the God of our fathers, so the same God, to guide and protect us in our efforts to continue the principles. And by these principles, by God's blessing, our fathers were able to justify, establish, and give uh, to the people who came after them. Uh, sorry, uh, these principles that they were able, with the blessing of God, to pass on to the people after them. With the continuance of his favor ever gratefully acknowledged, we may hopefully look forward to success, to peace, and to prosperity. So as we continue, as we thankfully acknowledge God's continuing favor, blessing, let us hope that we can look forward to success, peace, and prosperity, which means wealth. So this paragraph is saying, that even though the times are dangerous, when I look out and see that everyone is united, uh, when I see that we don't have to choose between sacrifice and our high values, it makes me happy. Obstacles may slow us down, but they cannot stop this movement that God and our people support. So let us thank God and ask him to protect us as we try to continue what our founding fathers have started. And if God continues to support us, we can look forward to success, peace, and wealth. 
the author says that this is filled with irony, and this is because this speech was given just before the war began. So the last thing he could look forward to was success, peace, and prosperity. And with that, having spoken for barely 15 minutes, he concluded. So it was a very short speech, just 15 minutes. The inaugural address had contained not a single memorable phrase or idea. Even Davis's admirers would rarely quote it. So it was a short speech, nothing to remember. The address was most notable for what it left out. Any attempt to explain how a nation could possibly remain viable, let alone democratic, if it were founded on the principle that any constituent part might withdraw as soon as it found itself in the minority on an important political issue. Viable means workable, doable. Um, so the author is talking about this part. It is the right of people to abolish or, or alter the government at will whenever it becomes destructive of the ends for which it was established. So when the people think that the government is not working for them, they can change it, they can cancel it. And the author is asking, if any time a group of people thinks that the government is not working for them simply because the government does not agree with them, and then they can just decide to leave the country. How would this country continue to exist? If as soon as you disagree, you can leave, what will be left? And the author says that this is the most important question that the speech did not answer. This was the fundamental philosophical absurdity, on which the whole confederacy was constructed, like a grandiose classical edifice on a foundation of sand. It's like building a great, big, beautiful building on sand. The new president's failure to address it did not bode well. It was not a good sign. Indeed, it was an early symptom of a fatal condition. So Davis spoke for 15 minutes, did not mention slavery, did not explain the new system of government. It is instructive to compare, haha, <laughs> compare, we're here, Davis's inaugural address and its method of composition or writing with Abraham Lincoln's two weeks later. So now we're getting into the comparison with Lincoln. Lincoln had begun work on his speech not long after his election. By late January, he had buckled down in earnest, so he had got down to work hiding out in a small room in a shop belonging to his brother-in-law, where he would not be disturbed. So Davis spent one day writing his speech. Lincoln started writing as soon as he knew he would be president. He had asked his law partner, so Lincoln used to be a lawyer before he became president. So he had asked his law partner, William Herndon, to procure or get copies of uh, five important documents. Henry Clay's 1850 address to the Senate, Daniel Webster's debates with Senator Robert Hayne of South Carolina, Andrew Jackson's statement against nullification, George Washington's farewell address, and the Constitution. All five of these have to do with the political situation at that time. 
the first two, the speech and the debates, were about whether it is legal to leave the country. Andrew Jackson was a is a former president. During his time as president, South Carolina uh, tried to say that this law, a certain law, was a bad law. It was uh, wrong for this law to be created, and so we will not follow that law. In Chinese, we call this e fa fei fa. And the, the English term is nullification. Null means nothing, empty. Here it means no power. So to nullify means to make have no power. People who supported nullification said that a bad law has no power. Now, Jackson was the president, so of course he disagreed, right? Any law that we pass, you have to follow. And in the end, Jackson won this debate. Washington's farewell address. This is an incredibly important speech. Did you know that Americans could be, be president more than twice? until the end of the Second World War. Like today, we th we take this as a matter of course, right? If you're president, you can only be elected twice. You cannot be elected three times. But in the US, that was not a law until Franklin D. Roosevelt, was elected four times, and he died during office uh, the fourth time. And the reason that there was no law and yet people still uh, stopped trying to become president after the second time is because of Washington. George Washington, first president of the United States, was for the first time was elected unanimously. Everybody voted for him, no exceptions. When he was trying to get reelected, he was again voted for unanimously. And Washington realized, if I keep saying that I want to be president, everybody will keep voting for me. And so I would just be another king. In that case, why did we leave England? Why are we doing the same thing that England is doing? Why did we bother to form a new country? So he decided at the end of his second term to retire. And so this is the speech where he announced his retirement. And he explained why it is important to let other people be president. So for over a hundred years, the only reason why people did not try to be president a third time was because of this speech. Not a law, simply because Washington said it's the right thing to do. So it's a very, very important speech. And of course, the Constitution, Xianfa, also very important. So whereas Jefferson Davis woke up at 10 a.m., sat down and wrote a speech, Lincoln spent, it says, six weeks. He asked for information and support. Uh, he put all of these important ideas into his own speech. Lincoln would continue working on the address over the course of six weeks until the very morning of his swearing in. Swearing in is to enter office. It's called swearing in because you have to put your hand on the Bible and you swear to uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States. Uh, So Lincoln kept working on his speech all the way until he became president. The thinness of Davis's speech and of his preparation cannot be blamed merely on haste or inattention. So it's not just because he had to hurry. It's not just because he was careless. Rather, it betrayed an alarming void at the center of the self-proclaimed Confederate Republic. 
So even more than hurry and carelessness, the author thinks that the lack of content in the speech reflected a lack of belief at the center of the Confederacy. Void means empty. There was nothing at the center. The hard work that Lincoln had put into his message attested to his faith in the power and necessity of words, of arguments, of explanations in a democratic system. In a democracy, your support comes from the people. So to win the people's support, you have to explain your ideas. You have to convince them to support you. So you have to have words. You have to present arguments. You have to have explanations. By contrast, the lackluster, which is the opposite of brilliant, shop worn, which is the opposite of new, rhetoric, which means words, language, of Davis and other leaders was not merely a failure of aesthetics, Meishri, but proof of the intellectual poverty and moral laziness undergirding their entire enterprise. Undergirding means beneath. Enterprise here just means effort. So the author says, why is Davis's speech so boring? Why does it have no nothing new in the speech? It's not simply because he didn't know how to write a good speech. It's also because the entire Confederacy lacked ideas. It had intellectual poverty. And it was morally lazy. They did not do the hard work of uh, forming new ideas. They did not do the hard work of thinking about what is the right thing to do. And so because they had nothing to say, the speech was short. It also revealed their lack of commitment to the essential democratic chores of persuasion and explanation. And so the author thinks that this also means the Southern leaders did not care very much about trying to explain to the people, trying to convince the people. Chores, duties, something you have to do. The Confederacy was never truly much of a cause, lost or otherwise. Cause here does not mean the opposite of effect. A cause is a belief that you fight for. Li Nian. The author says that the Confederacy didn't have a cause, whether it was lost or not. This is a reference to an idea held by many people in the South that the Southern government was correct. The Southern politics, the Southern ideology was correct. And so they should have won the war. And you might be thinking, how could they still believe that slavery was the right thing to do? Well, that's not what they believe. They believe that states should have the right to decide for themselves whether slavery is right or not. So for people who support the South even today, they're technically not supporting slavery. They're supporting what's called states' rights, the right of states to make their own laws, especially regarding slavery. But in fact, the author of this essay has already pointed out how stupid that idea is when he said that um, if a country allows anybody who disagrees to leave the country, then you don't have a country. So if you do follow states' rights, and you believe that when the US government is wrong, your state can just leave the country, then you don't believe in the country itself. Um, anyways, this idea is called the lost cause. Uh, so the author is saying, even if that were true, 
there really wasn't much of a big idea for the South to support anyway. In fact, it might better be called an effect, a reactive stratagem parted up with ex post facto justifications. So instead of saying that the Confederacy had a strong belief that they wanted to fight for, the author says that it, actually the Confederacy was reacting to the situation. It was a strategy that it was only later decorated, right, decorated with uh, after the fact reasons. So it's actually a reaction, and then later on people added reasons to make it look like uh, a belief. This would soon be borne out, would be proven, in the practices of the two national legislatures, Guohui. Over the next four years, the Confederate Congress would transact nearly all of its important business in secret. The Southern Congress would do almost all of its business in secret. Can you imagine a national Congress doing all of its business in secret? And even some of the most fervent or passionate secessionists would decry its lack of true accountability to the Southern public. If you don't know what your government is doing, you can't influence your government. You have no part in your government's actions, so it lacks true accountability. And then in the parentheses, we have an example. Uh, we'll come back to this example a bit later. By contrast, the Congress of the United States, notwithstanding all the bitter infighting that lay ahead, would never once go into closed session during the course of the war. So whereas the South did most of its business in secret, the North, even though people fought each other and argued very strongly, they never once closed the door to the public. Not once. That's what closed session means. In a legislature or in a court, a closed session is when you kick out the public. And the northern government did not do that a single time during the war. Uh, let's pause here. I'll explain the uh, example in the next period.
So we just talked about how the northern government is much more open and transparent than the southern one. And in fact, there is one example here of a southern gentleman who believed that this difference in transparency led to the South losing the war. Robert Barnwell Rett of South Carolina, a leading fire eater in 1860-1861. A fire eater is someone who very passionately argues for leaving the country. So he supported the South's decision to leave. Would later blame the South's loss on the absence of any informed public debate within the Confederacy that might have held the Davis administration's policies up to scrutiny. Scrutiny means examination. So this dude thinks that the South lost because the Southern government was working in secret, so the public did not have a chance to examine the government's policies, could not correct any mistakes or errors, and so when the government did something wrong, nobody stopped them, and gradually that led to the South losing the war. That's just one guy's opinion. Scholars today pretty much agree that the South lost for two reasons. One, most of the factories and industry was in the North, and you need industry to wage war, right? You have to make weapons, you have to like make equipment. The second reason is because the North decided that in every place that they won, they would set all of the black slaves free and the black slaves or the former slaves then joined the northern army. So it created a snowball, right? The more success the north had, the bigger their army got and the more powerful they got. Um, so like making decisions in secret, maybe it was one of the smaller factors, but it was not the key factor. In any case, uh, the South was much less democratic than the North. In fact, the most revealing words in the two contrasting inaugural addresses may have been those that came at the very beginning. Davis had opened his with gentlemen of the Congress of the Confederate States of America, friends and fellow citizens, a catalog of castes. Lincoln, though addressing an equally august assemblage, an equally important group of people, would begin his speech much more simply and democratically. My fellow citizens of the United States. So this is also another sign that the North was much more democratic than the South. Even in the way that Davis thought about his audience, he divided it into people, into different groups. Like if you had to give a presentation in front of the school, you would say, uh, dear president and like dear important people and then fellow students, right? You would divide it into groups. But when Lincoln talked, he thought of everybody as the same citizen. That's another sign that the North was more democratic. So let's look at the structure of comparison of this essay. It's saying that if you compare the way that these two speeches were written, the uh, opening of these two speeches, and if you think about the content um, we don't have the content of Lincoln's speech because that one is more famous. So the author assumes that the reader probably knows that one more than the reader would know Davis's speech. So we don't have a comparison there. But on these three points, we can see why Lincoln gave the better speech. And especially because of the difference in ideas. Um, the North had better ideas and that helped the North to win the war over the South, according to the author. So the first comparison is that 
Davis only started writing his speech the day before. Whereas Lincoln spent uh, six weeks writing his speech. Davis woke up at 10 a.m. and started to write. Whereas Lincoln asked his partner to collect all of this important information and these important ideas, and he tried to put them all into his speech. Davis spoke for only 15 minutes. Where is it? Here. Spoke for only 15 minutes. Lincoln, we can assume, spoke for much longer. So that is uh, about the preparation of the speech. The opening of the speech comes at the end of this essay. Davis started with different groups of people, whereas Lincoln addressed everyone equally. And this difference leads into a comparison of the ideas of North and South. So the South is in defense of slavery, but Davis was not willing to say that out loud in his speech. So already he is working against himself in this speech. Um, and then the author also compares the ideas between North and South. He points out that the South's Congress worked in secret. They chose their president in a non-democratic way. They chose him for the wrong reasons because he had fewer enemies and not because he was the better leader. Um, and so in all these comparisons, the North and Lincoln come out better. And so uh, when the author says that the new president's failure to address these problems did not bode well, it was not a good sign for the Southern government. I think this is his main point. You can tell from Davis's speech and the way that he prepared for it that the Southern government was not as solid and stable as the Northern government. Okay, do you have questions about this essay? All right, next week is peer review day. You should finish writing your comparison contrast essay and uh, agree with your group members on a deadline to exchange essays. So next week when you come to class, you will gather with your group and exchange ideas and feedback about everybody's essay. So I'll give you the rest of today to talk with your group members about uh, when you want to exchange essays. Uh, and if you don't yet know what you want to write about, you can also talk with your group members to find ideas.